today features Ambassador Frank Wisman. Our Ambassador Forum has now been taking place for three semesters, and I would like to thank you for all your support and help. And I hope you will continue giving us your support and help for the next semester. Frank Wisman is a former American ambassador uh, to Egypt, India, and some, some other important countries. Ambassador Wisman was also President Obama's special envoy to Egypt in the outgoing days of President Mubarak. It is a tremendous pleasure to welcome Ambassador Wisman to our Ambassador's Forum today. We are really very glad to have you here. I'm Klaus Larus. I'm the Rich Dan Kressner Distinguished Professor in History and International Affairs here at the University of North Carolina in sunny Chapel Hill. I would like to Kressner and the generous sponsors behind the Kressner uh, Distinguished Professorship for making possible this Ambassador's Forum. The Ambassador's Forum brings to campus prominent and stimulating diplomats and politicians who give public lectures and conduct seminars and workshops <coughs> with our students. UNC and Triangle Community, and in particular our graduate and undergraduate students, thus have the opportunity to engage firsthand uh, with international leaders and obtain insights into the practical application of their study of history, political science, European studies, international relations, and economics. <coughs> We have received much support and help. I am very grateful to our Center for European Studies and the EU Center of Excellence and also to the Triangle Institute for Security Studies, as well as to the Peace, War and Defense Curriculum, uh, UNC Global, and to the College of Arts and Sciences. Also, our international office has once again done a tremendous job in organizing this event today. To lead and take talks and discussions in the framework of our Ambassador Forum and also the talks within the lecture series The United States uh, in World Affairs can be watched on our YouTube channel. The address is youtube.com slash USC. Please do not hesitate to watch the videos as often as you possibly can. <laughs> <laughs> they are all totally free and they really make highly exciting viewing. <laughs> Once again, I would like to express my great pleasure and gratitude uh, for, to Ambassador Frank Wisner and for joining us today. Ambassador Wisner has had a most interesting career in diplomacy, government service, and the private sector. In a minute, Professor Jonathan Hartley, the Dean of, of the College of Arts and Sciences, will introduce Ambassador Wisner in greater detail. I would only like to say that after the Dean's introduction, Ambassador Wisner will talk about the United States, Europe, and the crisis in the Middle East. This will be followed by a round table discussion. And I have the great pleasure and honor to announce that Ambassador David Witt will join Ambassador Wisner and myself for the round table discussion. Ambassador Litt is a former um, US ambassador to the United uh, Arab Emirates, as well as a foreign service um, officer in Syria and uh, some other Middle Eastern countries. And it's great to have yet another Middle Eastern expert here today. Yeah. That is a real treat. Thank you very much. A real one. After half an hour or so, after the roundtable discussion, we will open the floor to questions from you, the audience. Please feel encouraged to uh, ask as many challenging and interesting questions as possible. And we can have a very long Q&A session, so please feel encouraged to join in. And toward the end of the evening, we will have a reception just outside this hall here today. And during that reception, you can, of course, mingle and uh, ask further questions to Ambassador Wisner and the best in love thing. I would now like to hand over to Dean Johnson Harding, who will introduce Ambassador Wisner. Thank you. Well, thank you, Klaus, and uh, thank you for that promotion. Uh, I am actually the senior associate for social sciences and global programs in the College of Arts and Sciences. Uh, I'm really delighted to be here, and uh, let me also thank you, Ambassador Lynn, for being part of this panel discussion as well. It's wonderful to be here and to welcome everyone to this Ambassadors Forum. The College of Arts and Sciences is proud to be a co-sponsor of the Ambassadors Forum, along with uh, all the other units that Klaus mentioned. One of our priorities is to provide our students with a global education, and the Forum plays an important role in bringing prominent diplomats to campus to share their experiences with our students through lectures and seminars. On behalf of the College, I would like to thank Klaus for establishing the Forum and for his efforts to expose Carolina students to an array of impressive current and former ambassadors. 
Our distinguished guests have come from or been engaged with a wide range of states spanning the globe, and their insights help us to better understand the aspirations of countries and peoples around the world. We are privileged to hear from the Honorable Frank Wisner today about the United States, Europe, and the crises in the Middle East. In light of increased <coughs> tensions in the Middle East and in Syria especially, Ambassador Wisner's presentation and discussion comes at a very topical and important time. Ambassador Wisner has had an extensive and highly distinguished diplomatic career. A 2011 New York Times article about Ambassador Wisner quoted R. Nicholas Burns as saying, quote, he's one of the supreme American diplomats of the last 30 to 40 years, unquote. As Klaus noted, he has served as U.S. Ambassador to Zambia, the Philippines, and India, and most relevant to the topic tonight, as U.S. Ambassador to Egypt. He has also served as Under Secretary of Defense for Policy, Under Secretary of State for International Security Affairs, and Senior Deputy Assistant Secretary for African Affairs. Ambassador Wisner joined the State Department as a Foreign Service Officer after graduating from Princeton University in 1961. His first postings were in Algiers and Vietnam before serving as a senior diplomat in Tunisia and Bangladesh. He returned to Washington, where he served as deputy director for the President's Interagency Task Force on Indochina, which was responsible for the evacuation and resettlement of nearly one million refugees. Later, as director of the Office of Southern African Affairs, he worked with Secretary of State Henry Kissinger to launch negotiations with Zimbabwe and Namibia. In 2005, Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice appointed Ambassador Wisner as the U.S. Special Representative for the Kosovo Status Office. He was play a crucial role in the negotiations which led to Kosovo's independence. In 2011, he was sent to Egypt by President Barack Obama to assist in delegate negotiations with then President Mubarak. He served as Vice Chairman of External Affairs for American International Group before assuming his current role as Foreign Affairs Advisor for Patton Boggs, where he provides clients with strategic global advice concerning business, politics, and international law. Please join me in welcoming Ambassador Thank you. That was um, an extraordinary introduction. I'm quite humbled by it to see my whole life flash by me. Thank you so much. Um, David Litt, I've admired your career for many, many years, and I'm delighted that you now find yourself in Chapel Hill. Um, <clears throat> you're a very lucky man. This is a beautiful place. Klaus, um, Klaus Lores, I have many reasons to admire you. I think, as many of you know, Klaus served as a Kissinger Fellow at the Library of Congress and produced a terrific work on Churchill and the Cold War. Great historian, and I recommend his book to all of you who might not have read it. It is absolutely superb account of the early days of the Cold War and our engagement with Britain. Uh, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, it remains to me to say thank you to all of you for coming this evening. Uh, these are quite extraordinary times. I will do my best to contribute thoughts of my own, and I do very much hope that each of you will take a minute afterwards and give me your questions. I will do the best I can, and any that overwhelm me, I will ask David Litt to step in for me. <laughs> David, stand warned. Um, but these are truly, truly extraordinary days. The past 10 days have been amazing for the United States, wounding for our country. They have been wounding for our foreign policy. We have been brought 
to this point by the crisis that is unfolded in the Middle East and particularly in Syria and most notably at present by the chemical weapons attack that took place in a suburb of Damascus, a weapons attack that only yesterday the UN inspectors confirmed had been conducted by air-to-ground missiles, which lays responsibility for the attack virtually without question at the feet of the Syrian government. Many months ago, we all remember when the president took a step back, looked at the crisis in Syria, looked at the threat of chemical weapons, and said that the United States would not stand idly by if chemical weapons were to be used again. He went on in drawing his red line to make it clear we would act. And yet in the first occasion when chemical weapons were used under slightly more ambiguous circumstances, we hesitated. We hesitated and yet we did not act we, a red line notwithstanding. But what we failed to do in that first instance of warning was to reach out to friend and ally alike and begin to draw together a coalition that would act politically and even beyond that in the event that chemical weapons were to be used again. We did not use the time available to us to build an international or a domestic consensus around the way the United States could or should act in the event that chemical weapons found their way again onto the Syrian battlefield. And therefore, when this crisis broke out, the President and all of us found ourselves standing at lo alone rebuffed by friends, rebuffed by our ill-wishers around the world, rebuffed even in the UK Parliament without a chance that either NATO or the Security Council would come in our support, without even sufficient support in our Congress on the Democratic or Republican sides of the House when the president turned to them to legitimize the policy that he had initially articulated. And then, in the third volta face, the president seized President Putin of Russia's lifeline to seek <coughs> Syrian agreement, to put Syrian chemical weapons under Con international control and then over a period of time running into next year to begin to destroy them and maybe, maybe to move from this moment forward into a political discussion of Syria's future in Geneva. None of us, none of us this evening should make any mistake that however this crisis plays out we, as Americans, have been dealt a dreadful blow. Our international credibility as a nation that others can turn to, our own confidence in ourselves, our reputation for competent management in world affairs, our own statesmanship have been called into question, and we will take more than a while to recover. Make no mistake about it either. There will be consequences for these past 10 days. Russia's standing has changed in the world. Her prestige has risen, albeit Russia doesn't have the strength and effect to be able to carry much forward beyond diplomatic maneuver, neither its armed forces nor its economy give it the heft that the former Soviet Union had. But nonetheless, Russia has emerged as a strong force. So much emboldened stands Bashar al-Assad, the Syrian president, who has been emboldened by these actions, his ability to stay in power and manipulate events,
has been substantially strengthened and his enemies, that loose coalition of opponents who man the other side of the walls in Syria's civil war have been weakened. But most of all, and of greatest concern to each one of us, is the fact that leaders around the world question America's resolve and America's competence, and not just Putin, who openly asks some basic questions about the chaos that was sowed in the wake of our misadventures in Iraq and Afghanistan, the troubles that have lingered in Libya. And to them, we can add the undermining of our own domestic confidence, trust amongst ourselves and our government and in our leadership in America's role in the world, the role that we as Americans need to play. This is not a good situation. The crisis, though, that I would I refer to and hearken to your attention is a crisis we must confront, for it is our own crisis. It's brought on by ourselves, not by others. It is brought on fundamentally by American decisions that have been shaped over the past two decades since the end of the Cold War. We have chosen to ignore through successive administrations and not just this one, the key factors of statecraft. First, the careful calculation of national interest. What must a nation do in its own interests and its own defense? And second, the overwhelming requirement of the elaboration of national strategy, wherein we assess a situation, calculate consequences, and lay out carefully drawn plans. We have also failed to use to their proper extent the tools of diplomacy to build a consensus around which we can pursue our purposes internationally and a consensus at home in support of our policies, a consensus abroad that permits other nations to act with us, to share burdens, to complement, and to enhance what we do. Instead, it has been an American habit to rely excessively on military means to pursue our decisions. Ladies and gentlemen, it goes without saying that the locus of our present misfortune lies in the Middle East, a region which for centuries has been at the heart of the contest for global power. Nations have risen and fallen Empires have come and gone, but many, if not most, have sought to be able to influence global events in their defense or favor by being able to exercise influence in the Middle East. And add to this historic truth the modern salience of hydrocarbons, hydrocarbon wealth, which has made the Middle East indispensable less to us than to our European allies, our friends in Asia, and the global economy. And then there lies the great American commitment, a moral commitment of the deepest sort to the protection of the welfare and life of another nation and people, the state of Israel. All three of these reasons impel us to the Middle East. No shale oil revolution in the United States, no disengagement from other conflicts will free our hands, no ability to pivot to other regions of the world, however important to us, will spare us as Americans responsibility for protecting looking after our interests in the Middle East. For the Middle East has been, is, 
and will for as far, lo far ahead as any of us can see, a turbulent place, a place that has been freshly turbulent over the last hundred years since the fall of the Ottoman Empire, a region whose borders, governance, economic performance, whose social structures have all been contended and at issue. A region special in that almost unique mixture of religion and politics in defining the identity of a nation, a unique factor especially true of the Middle East, but a region for those of us who've been privileged to live and work in it of great pride, of prickly sensitivity, but a region terribly divided. A region in which great powers have traditionally and now contested to have their word and sway and are now joined by regional powers, Turkey and Iran, to see who has the upper hand. Add to all of this, over the past two and a half years, a tidal wave of revolution has swept the Arab region of the Middle East. Governments in Egypt, in Tunisia, in Libya and Yemen have fallen. Others teeter today, still others are struggling to stay ahead of the tide, even old friends among the monarchs in Jordan, Saudi Arabia, the Emirates, the Gulf nations in general. And the trouble that has destabilized so many governments has even spread beyond the borders of the Arab world. Witness the sad crisis that broke out in the weak nation of Mali last, <clears throat> last summer and which almost brought that nation to its knees, a direct consequence of the, of the issues in Libya. In addition to the shaking of state structures and the collapse of states, has come new challenges that will define the region for years to come. The issue of whether Islamic politics will dominate domestic affairs in many Arab countries has come really to the fore. The Sunni Shia crisis long hidden in Arab life is now on the surface and is bloody and ugly. Ethnic troubles are to be found for the first time in many years among Kurds, among Berbers, Southern Sudanese, ethnic tensions that I didn't grow up with when I first served in the region. And add to this the social tensions that this revolutionary period has and will continue to bring to the fore. The revolution that you and I are witnessing is a continuum of a century long struggle among Arabs to find their identity, choose their governance, and secure their place in our modern, rapidly changing world and at the same time to preserve their ancient faiths and cultures which hold Arabs and others in the region, Turks and Iranians, in an iron grip. It is, in a word, impossible, impossible to predict where this revolutionary surge will end or what the Arab world will look like when the tide abates. Will it be more democratic? Will it be more tolerant? Will it be more oriented towards free markets? What will be the balance of power among outsiders? We don't know. We can't answer that question today. We know that it will play out over years. But as the events of the last 10 days should have amply demonstrated to all of us, we as Americans will be involved, which means we have to reflect carefully on what our core interests are, what our strategy is, and how to use our diplomacy 
at a time in which policies and assumptions that were long held have been overturned. The next chapter of the United States in this region will be written predominantly in three countries, in Syria, in, in Egypt, and Iran. And so I will focus much of the balance of my remarks on the situation in each of those countries and build on the theme of interests and strategy that I've tried to stress with all of you so far. First of all, Syria. Why Syria? Syria lies at the heart of the Levant. It is around Syria that much of Arab and Muslim history has been built, where Arab nationalism first emerged. A nation in its present definition that first brought to contest the ambitions of the French and the British. An amazing country, a beautiful country, rich and subtle in its traditions. Inside that country was a minority, the Alawites, living in mountains in the northwestern part of the country, largely marginalized, discriminated against, ill-treated, until the French colonial period, when the French, in a classic imperial maneuver of divide and rule, invited the Alawites to come and form much of the officer corps of the new Syrian army. That morphed slowly into an Alawite presence in the security services, a coup, and the installation of the Assad family father and son and their political party, the Ba'ath. Over the past decades, Alawites, Ba'ath, and Assads have ruled Syria, and the Assads have done it brilliantly. They've learned to play an extraordinary game of balancing power in the region, keeping and playing great powers off once, one against the other, and in the region simultaneously acting both as arsonist and firefighter. They are brutal in their habits, they are smart and cunning in their tactics. As Henry Kissinger once said in looking at Syria after the 1973 war, there is no war without Egypt, but there can be no peace in the Middle East without Syria. And yet, under this control, controlled regime rested a fractured polity. Syria is a nation of minorities, badly broken. Majority Sunni, Alawites, Christians, Kurds, a few Druze, a nation of many pieces that fit together, ill fit together, and are ruled best by a strong hand, at least as the Assads have seen it. I believe that we as Americans several years ago misunderstood fundamentally the challenge of Syria. We made several misstatements that we all have reason to regret. The president said that Assad had to go. That was going to be easier to call for than accomplish. We probably underestimated the cost to our friends in the region the amount of damage that could be done to Jordan, to Lebanon, the potential for yet further damage to an already creaky situation in Iraq that Syria with its civil war would bring. We even made the mistake of thinking that somehow the end of the civil war in Syria could deliver a knockout blow to Iran's pretensions to extend its defenses westward and engage Israel through pressure. None of these illusions, I will argue, have played out. At least we avoided a military intervention. That's the right thing to have avoided. But the chemical weapons 
posed a different challenge. The United States has been party to a chemical weapons ban since the mid-1920s. We have seen it violated in the past, but we are right as an international force to stand against the use of those weapons. The Syrians hold up to a thousand tons by their own admission, and they have now used them. It's not easy to walk away from a presidential commitment. But there has been throughout our adventure in Syria a missing element, and that is our failure to identify and pursue in a single-minded manner a political objective. We have not set about the shaping of a post-Assad Syria. We have worked along the edges trying to form coalitions. We have only recently begun to talk about returning to Geneva, but we have not set about carefully to explain at home or abroad what we want and explore what others want. Russia, Iran, we have shunned. Arabs, Turks, Syrians, we haven't listened carefully enough. We've not tested the concept fully in our own minds as to whether an arrangement like that negotiated in the late 1970s for Lebanon could provide a transitional arrangement inside of Syria. And so today, in seizing the Russian offer of a chemical weapons ban, we may finally have opened the door to a political approach and get ourselves where we should be with the region, together with the region, to Geneva. But we're just beginning and it's late in the day. If that's a way forward in Syria, what about Egypt? Why Egypt? Why is Egypt important? I don't have to tell you about Egypt's size or place in history. You know those as well as I do. But perhaps you weren't all born as long ago as I was and remember just how vitally important it was to the United States to break Egypt out of its arrangements with the former Soviet Union and to secure peace between Egypt and Israel. American diplomacy pay, played key roles in both regards. Local statesmen, Begin in Israel, Sadat in Egypt, did more than their own share to make these realities come to pass, but they became bedrocks of what was a very successful period of American diplomacy in the Middle East. And Egypt during this period ended up as a key pillar of our policies, preserving peace with Israel, dealing with other regional crises. Without Egypt, can you imagine our ability to have conducted a war in Iraq or even today to be able to move supplies to our forces in Afghanistan? Egypt is of central strategic significance to the United States. And any idle talk about cutting off military assistance and breaking our ties with the Egyptian army should be looked at with the greatest skepticism. We faced instead in Egypt with the fall of Mubarak, we hoped to see an opportunity, the arrival of a new political force on the scene whose very discipline and determination had led it to a close victory in the presidential elections. The Muslim Brothers, they exercised power for nearly a year. And during the course of the 12 months or so that they were in power, they lived out the words of their spiritual founder, Said Qutb, who reminded his followers before he was hanged in the time of Gamal Abdel Nasser 
that Islam to be an agent of salvation in our lives must be able to rule. Islam is not a force simply to be respected in houses of worship. It has to rule and run life in the right way. Without the ability to govern, it has no meaning in Muslim societies. The Muslim brothers in the 12 months they held power in Egypt, carried out Said al-Qutub's prognosis with perfect discipline. Not particularly competent, but they muscled aside their opponents, stacked the decks for a constitution, began reworking the uh, institutions of the Egyptian state of monopolizing power in their own name. And as the year advanced, Egyptians began to build in opposition to the Muslim Brothers until by the spring of this year, an enormous force in Egyptian political life, Tamarad, the rebellion, took shape. And by the end of the day, in July of this year, in June and July, millions of Egyptians were on the streets demanding the recall of Morsi and his government. The response of the Muslim brothers to the army's intervention and the quelling of the potential outbursts was either Morsi or Jihad. And the story that's played out on the streets of Cairo through, August, through late July and August was bloody and nasty, proving the point that Morsi or Jihad, at least in this round, the Egyptian army and its allies would be in power, hold and secure power, and shape in the immediate future, Egypt's future. We as Americans are faced with a new reality. We didn't make this situation. We didn't wish it on Egypt. We would have liked it if it were possible to see democratic instruments play out and find their own footing and governments alternate in an orderly fashion. But our wishes are not enforceable. Our dreams are not able to be achieved by means available to us. And so we have to ask ourselves, what do we do now? In fact, I'm prepared to ask all of you where are our values better served? By a civilian dispensation in Egypt with a chance to move towards democracy or in the direction that the Muslim Brothers had charted. We may well end up with a halfway house on the way to a return to democratic rule and it may take years to get there. But the chances in my judgment based on my years of associating with Egypt are much greater with the present dispensation than with the previous one. But the core is do we stand by Egypt? Is Egypt important to us? And to that my answer is categorically yes. And with that answer comes responsibility. We have to be ready to work with Egypt and particularly to settle down and help Egypt as we gird ourselves for the coming economic battle. The third issue and final one I'll touch on is the question of Iran, for it will come sharply back into focus in the course of this year. We will be faced once again with whether the United States could or should end up in a violent struggle with another Middle Eastern nation, this time with Iran, over the issue of Iran's nuclear capability. But as the 12 months ahead of us begin, we are faced with, I would argue, a fundamentally different situation, an important one with a strong element of promise. The election of Rouhani as president of Iran, the formation of a government 
of people of great competence, many of whom know this country very well, the Foreign Minister Javad Zarif, Nahabandian, the Chief of the President's Cabinet, and more and many others, now responsible for the nuclear negotiations, offers the best chance of partners in dialogue we have ever seen since the Islamic Revolution took power in Iran and the Islamic Republic was formed. But we don't have forever to test that premise as to whether Iran is a partner in seeking an agreement. We have about 12 months in which the supreme leader's patience will be drawn. And we have very, very tough choices to make. If there is progress, will we relax sanctions? Will we take on the many constituencies that have reigned themselves against Iran? What is at stake is huge. There is no stability in the Middle East without Iran. You can't pretend or wish Iran away. There once was a time in American foreign policy when we included Iran in our policies and that was the right thing to do. Nor is there, let me assure you, any alternative to the Islamic Republic of Iran. A regime change is a pipe dream that we have pursued to our own damage for it is quite impossible to negotiate a modus vivendi with Iran if you happen to believe that your core objective is to change its government. Iran and the United States have no fundamental interests in opposition one to the other, provided that Iran does not threaten our friends in the region. We in Iran contest each other in no way, nor have we in our history. The grounds of finding a modus vivendi with Iran should not be impossible, tough as it has been. And it is tough. <coughs> the dossier of issues to be negotiated is very difficult. The nuclear question, the question of the region, where Iran will play its cards in Syria and Afghanistan, in Iraq, all are key questions. What will Iran's posture toward Israel be? All major issues. Do they have solutions? Are the hints that we have that Iran would be prepared to freeze nuclear enrichment at 5% and put the balance aside in a manner that could be secured internationally and join the major conventions in return for the United States relaxing sanctions and pursuing dialogue in other areas of differences. These are all issues to be explored. And a real challenge to our administration beset with huge questions elsewhere in the Middle East and at home to turn to it. And I don't make light of what the president, in pursuing diplomacy with Iran, will face. He will have stiff opposition in the Congress. In case anybody has any doubt, no sooner was Rouhani elected than 76 senators signed a letter to the president urging him to give no ground, whatever the reason, to the new Iranian leadership. Israel will remain bitterly skeptical. So will many of our friends in the Gulf be very, very skeptical. So it will be tough, but tough is where we need to be. So I take a step back with all of you this afternoon and look at this region. I opened on the theme of what has happened to us in the past 10 days and the price we are paying. <laughs> I told you at the outset that I believe our core problem is not Arabs, nor Russians, nor Israelis. Our problem is ourselves. We need to buckle down and come up with strategic direction.
to get a sense of confidence in ourselves and trust in and among our institutions. Trust with our friends and traditional allies. Trust born of renewed national strength. And I am an optimist about the direction of the American economy. Can we do all of this at a time of economic recovery? For those who are as old as I am, perhaps you will remember the gas lines in the early 70s when we were withdrawing from our largest military engagement in history in Vietnam, when we were opening a new relationship of peace with the Soviet Union, and when we were settling a decades-old quarrel with China, all at the same time. Can the United States pursue foreign policy? Indeed, we can. We've done it in the past, and there is no reason we can't do it again, provided we're careful, we choose our targets, assess our interests, and pursue diplomatic solutions, holding in reserve our considerable military strength. In the Middle East, not one size fits all. Each nation in the region calls for a different set of precise strategies. We can't expect to do the same in Syria that we did in Iraq, or that we evolve as our strategy towards Egypt. We must attend to the crisis between Israelis and the Palestinians, for that has been a cloud over our horizon for many years. The Middle East calls for many strategies, all of them compelling, all of them demanding, I would suggest your interest, and I hope I've succeeded in peaking it this evening. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much for your very informative and enlightening remarks. Can I follow up on some of your remarks and ask you maybe straight away about Syria? When you read the press, not least the European press, Putin is now a peacemaker. He has saved the world. Obama is a warmonger who wanted to bomb a country into oblivion. And uh, so what has happened? Has American diplomacy bungled so badly and will Assad be there forever? What, can you explain the situation to us? <laughs> well, I, I perhaps wouldn't start out quite where you, you began. Uh, no, Putin is not a peacemaker. Putin is a man of great discipline who is pursuing core Russian national interests. He wants to reestablish Russia as an effective player on the international scene. And he sees standing in his way the United States. The exercise of American power over these past years is a real issue for him. It's an issue in Russia's way to even protecting its near abroad. But Putin goes beyond that. He's impelled, and it's worth all of us remembering, by a view that the United States has not acted competently, that we have pursued objectives that have left chaos in our wake. I've never believed, I don't know if David agrees or not, that Putin is inexorably tied to the Syrian regime. I don't believe that. But I believe he does ask the question, what comes next? And our inability to answer that question or even to address it on a sustained basis with him has left him convinced that in the lurch he will be left. So that's what Putin is about. Now, I also don't agree with an assessment that Obama is a warmonger. Obama has every indication, may given us every assurance, given us every signal that he, as President of the United States, wants to end this cycle of American military involvement in the Middle East. And he's done it in Iraq, he will do it in Afghanistan, even if devil takes the hindmost. He does not want a military engagement in Syria. 
but to avoid a military engagement means you need to have very carefully set strategies for the Syrian problem affects the entire region. So I am, Klaus, of the view that we can get ourselves back together again and on the page, but it means sitting down and this time thinking through. And the two steps I tried to suggest to you all this evening. Number one, we missed an opportunity in not taking the original chemical weapons warning and translating it into an international coalition. And second, now that this terrible day, these days have passed, to set an agenda that will get us to Geneva and a transition, an aim to achieve, very hard to do, a transitional arrangement that will get beyond the naked out and out civil war. And it will be tough. And Assad will remain in power for the foreseeable future? I think there's absolutely no doubt that Assad will remain in power. Certainly, if you expect, I don't say there's any pleasure, he's a brute, but if you expect this man to control, contain, and maybe even destroy his chemical weapons, and to deliver his side to a transitional arrangement negotiation in Geneva, somebody's got to do that. Who's going to do it if he's not there? So I argued tonight with you, I argue again, that Assad's position has been strengthened as a player. He's not knocked out. But he's not alone. We didn't want to see Iran part. Iran must be part of a dispensation that gets you to Geneva. Can't negotiate Syria's future without Iran. It doesn't make sense. We've said no Iran, no Assad. We're going to have to swallow both points. Thank you. David. Uh, you've made a very articulate case of America's credibility being at stake, and as you just talked about, uh, Putin and Sergei Lavrov having the initiative at this point. Um, so if we assume that America's goals with respect to Syria are one, to take control over Syria's, and have the international community, the United Nations, take control over Syria's chemical weapons and ultimately destroy them. And then with respect to the, uh, the, the civil war, uh, to achieve a political uh, solution at Geneva or elsewhere, in which perhaps Assad and his um, individuals in the regime no longer participate in politics, as well as um, violent extremists on the other side do not. Assuming that those are America's goals, could you discuss for our group here what are some of the tools that the United States and its European allies could use, that we could be watching over the coming months that America could use to grab the initiative once again and to enhance the chances that those two goals could be achieved? Well, I, that's, that's a really good question, David, and uh, I'm going to turn back to you and get me to help me think through the steps. But I think I start with a core premise, and that is I want to set the United States on a path that says we Americans want to seek peace, a political solution, even if it's a transitional solution, and that we're going to be flexible on how we get there and who will be parties to this negotiation. I want us to downplay, we may retain the desire to see Assad eliminated and disappear, but I wouldn't want to make it a public precondition of the negotiation. I, of course, don't want to see Iran strengthened in the region to our detriment, but I don't make that a precondition publicly. My objective needs to be peacemaking. That puts us on the right side of history. 
The second thing I want to do is make it clear that if Assad breaks his word and backs away from Geneva, or Assad is uh, uses chemical weapons again, which personally I doubt under present circumstances is a likely outcome, then I want to maintain the credibility of the use of American military force. And I would like to believe under those circumstances we would use them without consult in advance, but without hobbling ourselves either to a specific set of criteria in the UN or NATO or anywhere else, or even presidential authority vis-a-vis -vis the Congress, if we are going to be serious and see our way through. Third, I would want to work very hard with my Arab allies, David, with the Saudis and the Qataris, particularly to focus on the tough job of getting to the table a credible, coherent, well-funded, non-Assad side, Syrian, free Syrian side. We don't have it today. That is a huge problem for this negotiation. And I believe it's got to be a very high priority. Four, I want to make it absolutely clear that if you can get a transition in which Assad's people and the free Syrians balance each other in some transitional arrangement, then write a constitution, that we are going to really be there, not reprogramming foreign assistance levels that exist on the books today, but ready to put some serious money behind the agreement and help in the huge job of the reconstruction of Syria. I would want to make it absolutely clear in the interim, with five million Syrians currently displaced, that we have the resources in this country to alleviate the burdens tiny countries like Lebanon with a million refugees are carrying. And if I believe we can't afford it, I really am astonished. If it's in our national interest, then I believe we can do it. If it's in our national interest to think about going to war, we certainly can find our national interest to fund peace. Thank you. Uh one thing that's been rattling around in my mind, you, you uh, very accurately pointed to the fact that Hafez al-Assad, if not Bashar, are very clever manipulators of the region. They know how to balance off interests. They're very good at playing this game. Uh, and as we know, Russia, too, is a very calculating and uh, adept chess player. Um, what do you think of the prospect that along the road, the Syrians and or their Russian uh, allies will throw out the condition, let's call it, that Syria will continue along this road of getting rid of its weapons of mass destruction, but only in the context of a broader regional weapon, WMD free zone, an issue that Russia has raised before, and something that Iran, too, is, uh, is very keen about with an eye toward Israel. Is this a likely or a possible gambit that we might see? And if so, how should the United States respond? Yes, I, I've seen even hints to that effect uh, coming out of Damascus that somehow uh, if Syria is going to put its chemical weapons on the table, then Israel should put its nuclear weapons on the table, and we ought to go for a three-ring circus all at once. But I think we know, the Russians know, the world knows, that would be a circus. It would result in nothing but confusion, noise, and no conceivable outcome. So far, the Russian diplomatic steps that I'm reading 
focus on the chemical weapons issue. I actually believe that Putin felt that sooner or later we would be dragged into a war with Syria and that his aim was to create a way to get out of that war threat. If you went down this road, we'd go nowhere and the Syrian civil war would continue and the prospect of reluctantly American military involvement would be back on the table. So I don't think Assad, if he tried that, would find many, many takers and many allies. Thank you. And of course, Putin wouldn't be interested in chemical weapons. The Syrians passing on chemical weapons falling into rebel hands anyway. Oh, so yeah. he would be in favor of uh, getting rid of the chemical weapons too. But let me jump to, to Iran and let me play devil's advocate again. As we all know, the Iranians are busy trying to develop a nuclear weapon or nuclear weapons. Despite what uh, the Iranians themselves say, I think we're all convinced that that is their ultimate uh, goal. But would it really matter if the Iranians had a nuclear bomb? Would that really be as dangerous as we can read uh, in the American press and the European press coming out of the White House? I mean, after all, the Indians, the Pakistani, not to speak of the Chinese, the British, the French, the Russians, of course, have a nuclear bomb. Would the Iranians really use it or would they just use it as self-protection? Because the Iranians know if Iraq under Saddam Hussein had had a nuclear weapon, the invasion of 2003 wouldn't have taken place. So isn't it just a well understood self-protection what they are all about? Should we really fear a nuclear bomb? Why not give it to them? Ah. Well, I, I would not argue that is an American stra policy. Uh, giving, providing Iran with a nuclear weapon, I think you'd find find a few a few opponents. I'm totally serious. I know you weren't. I know you weren't. Uh, first of all, Klaus, I, I'm I have to start out. I don't share with you your opening premise. I do not believe, nor does our intelligence community believe, the Iranians have made a decision to develop a nuclear weapon. They've made a decision to develop the capabilities inherent in having a nuclear weapon. But they have not made a decision by any means known to us. And if that decision were implemented, there is no single issue in the world more closely observed than Iran's nuclear capability. We would see multiple signs of this happening. Now, I, I don't think that's your core point. Uh, whether Iran has a capability and is three canoe paddle strokes from the shore or on the shore almost doesn't matter. It certainly doesn't matter a great deal to the Israelis. But let's again remember what at least I believe is the core Israeli concern. Uh, David, please disagree with me, but I don't believe the Israelis believe the Iranians will use a nuclear weapon against Israel. They can't deliver it. Its chances of falling anywhere but on the target would be very great. The chances of the Israelis retaliating in the most gruesome manner would be absolutely overwhelming. Is it possible the Iranians could miniaturize and subcontract a nuclear weapon, highly unlikely. We've never seen a nation willing to subcontract with terrorists. We've seen many cases in which the terrorist returns to bite the hand of those that armed him. I don't think that's a real issue. What I think has been most on Israel's mind has been the change in the balance of power in the region if Iran acquired a serious nuclear weapon capability potential and what that would do to embolden Israel's enemies. And that puts us as Americans in Israel actually somewhat apart. For we've talked about a weapon Israel's more concerned about the image of a weapon as I see it. Now, should 
we be concerned about either or? And I think the answer is yes. We have to be, and not just because the Congress is spun up and, and many other uh, reasons to be concerned, but frankly, the record, the amount of confidence that exists between the United States and Iran after 30 years of bitter controversy and division is so low that we wouldn't trust them and they wouldn't us. And the chances of miscalculation would simply be too great. On top of it, I believe that it is possible to get many elements of a nuclear stand down in place so you don't have to face the choice you gave us. It is conceivable that deterrence has its own merits. But the Middle East is a lousy environment for playing with the dangers of deterrent warfare. I would rather seek political engagement and try to negotiate a package that would give us greater security. Iran will not go those last 10 yards. I think that's a pretty uncontroversial position. Thank you. For what it's worth, I completely agree with you on the assessment of Israel's view of Iran obtaining a nuclear weapon. And by the way, Israel is not alone in that. Um, Saudi Arabia, the Emirates, Bahrain, Kuwait, Qatar, that shares a nuclear oil field with, uh, with uh, I mean, a gas field with, uh, with Iran, also are concerned about uh, in enhancing Iran's projection of political power having a nuclear weapon. Um, but I I'd like to shift the focus before we uh, lose too many of our folks um, to Egypt, given your experience there. Uh, I was very perturbed at the Criticism, very harsh and ugly criticism of a good friend, uh, Ambassador Ann Patterson in, in, in Cairo, and the accusations that she was either pro in, in supporting the Muslim Brotherhood or supporting the army, both at the same time. Well, what do you think, what do you make of that criticism? Is there some way that the embassy should handle that better? What, what do you think? Uh, David, you and I have been in the diplomatic service and perhaps one of the great lessons of our lives is we don't second guess, particularly predecessors. I don't know exactly what Anne said on every occasion. I know that she's a great foreign service officer and a superior person and an extraordinarily able diplomat. And so I'm always gonna bet on Anne's horse to win a race. But what is also clear, unfortunately right now, in that highly overwrought circumstance in Cairo, uh, that Anne became the object of a lot of hostility. And that hostility is not solely about Anne personally, but about the United States. And this relationship that's so important to us has been damaged uh, by Egyptians feeling we have no sentiment for what they've gone through of the dangers they felt in their lives from a full takeover of the Muslim Brotherhood and they are angry. And it's going to take a while. Egyptians have good sense, they tend to calm down. But it's going to take a while. And it's going to take the United States making it clear we are prepared to stand by. I am not a friend of the American argument that we have to cut off Egypt and punish them. I cannot figure out what we're trying to accomplish with such an argument, and I believe it flies in the face of American interests, a point I elaborated from the podium. But I do know that it's going to take a lot of work to rebuild our standing in Egypt. And here I think we've been handed a golden opportunity, and that is the economic circumstance Egypt faces. We can do three things. One, we can produce public and private capital that's badly needed. Two, 
we can mobilize other donors so we pursue common strategies and not have the Saudis throwing money here and the Qataris throwing money, pulling money back there and aim to use our diplomatic capabilities to produce support around an Egyptian economic plan. And third, to sit down quietly with Egypt's key economic planners, all of whom have been trained in this country and worked here and worked with Americans in the past who speak our language and understand our economic logic and put together strategies to cope with a very difficult circumstance.